Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Gerald Turkis. I work here in the library, and it is my privilege to welcome you to this Scholarship at Villanova event. The Scholarship at Villanova Lecture Series serves to recognize the scholarly publications, ongoing research, and other intellectual contributions of faculty members from all four colleges of Villanova University. Growing out of a long-standing tradition of faculty research and book talks at Fowdy, Scholarship at Villanova developed in the spring of 2004. The library hosts six lectures in the series per year. Scholarship at Villanova presentations are always free, open to the public, and held in the library. It's my honor to introduce today's future speaker, Dr. Sally Scholes. Dr. Scholes is Professor of Philosophy at Villanova University. She has written extensively on violence against women, <coughs> oppression, solidarity, and related issues in ethics and political theory. Her books include On De Beauvoir, On Rousseau, Political Solidarity, and Feminism, A Beginner's Guide. She is currently working on issues related to global feminisms and human rights. She is a former editor of the APA newsletter on feminism and philosophy, and is currently editor, editor of Hypatia, a journal of feminist philosophy. Dr. Scholl's talk is titled, Seeking Solidarity. Join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Scholl's. Um, thank you very much, and, and thank you all so much for uh, coming out today. The, the scholarship at, um, is it Scholarship at Villanova or Scholarship at Falvey? Scholarship at Villanova um, series is a wonderful series, and, and there have been some um, truly amazing scholars uh, uh, presenting at it. And, um, and, and actually, I was uh, pleased to be able to present on Solidarity when, the, when my book on Solidarity initially came out in 2008. So, um, so this is a, a bit of a repeat uh, vision or, or visit for me, and I'm uh, delighted to be able to share with you some of what I've done since or where I'm going uh, with it. I still work on solidarity, and, and I'm still seeking it. So um, the uh, solidarity is, is such an interesting term, and um, let me go back here, um, and it, it often has this very, very positive connotation. And whenever I present on solidarity, uh, pretty much no matter what I'm presenting on, someone says, you know, why, why is it that you presume hope? And I, and I haven't said anything about hope, and I haven't presumed it. And then I say, well, well, now, why do you think that I'm presuming hope? And it, it, largely, I think it, it comes from the way solidarity is used. So my work on solidarity, I suppose you could say, began by looking at a sort of descriptive account. What is it that people, oh, I've got a, a floater on my scene here. Um, what is it that people mean when they use this term? And of course, they mean so many different things. And if you um, listen to the news tonight, you'll probably hear two or three different invocations of the term solidarity. Uh, and, and so getting at that descriptive account, I think also reveals a little bit something about us. Uh, one of the current uses that I'm terribly curious about and, and hope to connect up with some communication scholars to look at is military solidarity. Have you heard this term in the news? There, there's people talking about military solidarity and, and especially with some of the alliances that we are forming right now um, with different Arab countries. So, so the descriptive accounts only take me so far. And, and at some point I have to sort of as a philosopher throw up my hand and say, well, that's just interesting, but it, couldn't it just be people m misusing a word or, or using it willy-nilly however they wish? So then I turn to the conceptual. How has this term developed over time and, um, and what is the history? And, and here uh, I thankfully get to draw on one of the uh, favorite philosophers, um, or one of my favorite philosophers, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Most of the people who work on solidarity trace the, the origin of the concept, but not the term, to Rousseau. And in Rousseau's writings, you can see uh, all the three basic types that, that I um, work with, social, civil, and political solidarity. Now, Rousseau, of course, doesn't um, you know, pull out all of the different variations. Others do that. So Emile Durkheim in, in Sociology, I'm 
pointing to my colleague Rick Eckstein in sociology. <coughs> Emil Durkheim is uh, credited with developing social solidarity. Um, and of course, he also develops the moral relations of social solidarity. So you can't help but also de delve into the normative um, uh, with solidarity. What are the moral obligations that emerge when we think of solidarity as social solidarity, civil solidarity, and political? So my early work it starts with a, an attempt to articulate this, the social ontology of the groups in social, civil, and um, political solidarity. Now Durkheim already obviously did the civil, or sorry, the social part, so I didn't need to, to do that. But, um, but I did need to, to look at what it means to say a group is in political solidarity, and what is civil solidarity. So we, I began with a social ontology, and then I turned to the relations of political solidarity and, uh, and looked at the normative content there. Now the normative content of um, political solidarity, I started with what, what are the moral relations? How do we conceptualize the, uh, the relationships be within a solidarity group that is organized for a particular cause. So political solidarity is solidarity of social movements. It's the solidarity of peoples united to achieve something. <coughs> and, uh, and you see it uh, in descriptive accounts, of course, but you also see it in, um, in some of the conceptual uh, framework, even as early as or so. So uh, I began with the question of what are the moral relations? And then what do, sort of duties do they inform? And that's uh, where I turn to next with, the, uh, with political solidarity. Solidarity itself we can understand in, in whatever guise it takes as the, a unity that mediates between the individual and the community and entails positive duties. So unlike justice, solidarity actually asks something of us. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that justice doesn't ask something of us. But there are, are duties informed. And this is one reason why a lot of philosophers, so, political philosophers, shy away from um, articulating uh, theories of political solidarity. It, it is full of content, or it seems like it needs to be full of content. So I tried to uh, move away from the notion that it has to be full of content, but it, embrace the fact that we can talk about the positive duties that emerge from our moral relations within political solidarity. So this just gives you a little bit of a framework of, um, of the book. I say that there are three moral relations of solidarity. There's the relation, of course, uh, between the members in, s in s the solidarity group. There's the relationship between the members and the goal that motivates the group. And then there's the relationship of the group to the larger community. And each of these informs certain duties. And, I, and I've put them here uh, on the chart with bubbles just as a way of framing it. But uh, I get into more detail, uh, of course, in the book. But one thing you can think about here is uh, a lot of people, when they use the term solidarity, they're really talking about uh, the mutuality, that we, we are making a mutual commitment. We are, there's a shared sense of, um, uh, uh, of obligation to one another, that each member can uh, appeal to the others and expect the others to appeal to him or her for uh, something. Now, what that thing is depends on the, the particular aim of solidarity. The key um, with, I suppose, all of the relations is that we see our actions as connected with each other, that um, the actions of the others, even trivial actions, actually might contribute to solidarity or even harm solidarity. So the, there's a, a presumed equality here, not just among the members, but also a, among the act, actions that we um, uh, adopt in pursuit of solidarity. Now, cooperation, cooperation can be cast out in a number of different ways, but, uh, but as a, a moral duty of solidarity, I suggest that cooperation means that you're committed to joint activity. And joint activity could be that I see my activity as, as in concert with others, or it can be that we actually organize together as a collective to accomplish a certain goal. So I talk a little bit about these things. And then uh, the understanding is really probably better I, uh, placed as, as epistemic obligations. What is it that we owe each other? What sort of, of knowledge claims can any individual in solidarity make? And um, what sort of uh, obligations do we have to uh, obtain more information? 
Now, uh, a good bit of the book actually delves into the epistemic obligations of solidarity. And we can talk more about that if you wish, but, um, but I'll, uh, I'll just suggest that a, a lot of the work in contemporary epistemology, uh, in feminist epistemology, um, epistemologies of resistance, epistemologies of ignorance, uh, use solidarity as, a, as an organizing concept. And, and solidarity is partly what motivates the epistemological um, search. So it's how is it that an, uh, a privileged member can help um, an oppressed uh, member in society. What epistemic barrier needs to be overcome? So, um, so we can talk more about that if you wish. The relationships to the goal and to the larger community uh, in a way are, are sort of self-explanatory. If you're in solidarity, in political solidarity, um, it, it, it's sort of futile unless you make it known. So, uh, so activism and communication. The goal uh, I actually argue that the goal has a central place in political solidarity and that social criticism uh, is the moral obligation that emerges from that goal. When people join together in a unity for political solidarity, they're united around a goal. And I, I argue in the book that the moral relation or the moral commitment to the goal actually precedes the group. And that's what makes political solidarity different than social or civil solidarity. Social solidarity is the group actually exists first. So social solidarity would be the solidarity of a family or even the Villanova community. And it's because we are members of a community that we then have obligations. For political solidarity, we are actually joined first by our commitment to the goal. And, and it's that commitment that then motivates the group, um, really identifies the group, and uh, uh, um, of course motivates in the action that comes from it. So I use social criticism as the, the key uh, for understanding that it, it, it's our, uh, what, dissatisfaction with a certain element in society that allows us or that pushes us to respond to it in a collective way of, of solidarity. And then, of course, um, the social criticism within the movement, I argue that we have an obligation, uh, once united in solidarity and political solidarity, to uh, uh, affect social change. We actually have an obligation to continue to reflect back on ourselves and our actions and our, our groupness to, uh, through social criticism to make sure that our aims and our goals remain consistent. And I talk a lot about um, whether solidarity requires uh, a commitment to nonviolence and things like that. So that's that early foundational work on solidarity that, uh, that I did, or foundational for me, that is. More recently, my attention has turned to that challenge that I always get in conferences about uh, my, pre my presumed uh, presumption that solidarity is always positive. And I, so I ask, is it, is, it, is it necessary that it's positive? And of course, um, it's not only not necessary, but we probably could all cite examples of solidarities that fail. Solidarities that, that not only are um, uh, ineffective, but are actually harmful. And so my attention's turned to what um, I've called pernicious solidarities. And of course, in pursuing this, I chose to turn back to Rousseau to see what Rousseau had to say. But before I did, I, I thought, well, who else has talked about this? Surely I'm not the only one who has noted that solidarities can be dangerous. And of course, you know I'm not. There um, are a, a number of epistemological approaches to uh, understanding the dangers of solidarities. And, uh, and I've put them up here on the slide as falling into two main categories. I'm sure there are more, just for the ease of presentation. I've, I've selected these two. One is, an, uh, is what I call the uncritical weeness. This is when a group, a solidaristic group, comes together and, um, and fails to recognize uh, that the way, it's the way that they exclude. And Lorraine Code, an epistemologist out of Canada, has uh, discussed this fairly extensively. And she, her example is actually a community of philosophers, philosophers of science. And she says, uh, look, look at the examples that, that these folks use. Look at how they assume that we all understand. And I've, I've done this in talks. I know uh, we all fall into this at various points. There's an example of uncritical weakness. We all fall into this, right? I'm presuming that we are all the same in, in some significant fashion. That's an uncritical weakness. Now, a lot of times it's not harmful, but there are times when it is. And, and Code talks about uh, particular times when it is especially in the 
philosophical communities when the we-ness actually excludes certain perspectives that, um, that should be acknowledged. So perspectives of women, perspectives of um, uh, scholars, uh, minority scholars, scholars coming, with, uh, coming to philosophy from a variety of different positions, things like that. So that uncritical weeness can actually function as a silencing. And that's a, a, an epistemological, one epistemological approach to uh, addressing or thinking about pernicious solidarities. Another is the critical weeness. And here, here you want to think of groups that under, self-consciously understand themselves as a solidaristic group for social change. So uh, feminist group, for instance. And um, uh, if some of you are, are uh, gender or women's studies scholars or feminist scholars, then you know that uh, the feminist movement in the United States suffered a great deal of uh, uh, criticism in the, the late 70s and 80s because, uh, because of their critical weeness. They used we and us, the terms, to, to um, rally a group. They also used the term sisterhood to say we all share the same sorts of oppression. But in doing that, they actually, of course, excluded uh, those women who experience oppression quite differently. And they failed to recognize the ways that, that they are privileged, um, that we are privileged. And so uh, that critical weeness can be a self-conscious creation of a, a social justice group or a solidaristic group that fails to acknowledge its own relation and responsibility for oppression and even the oppression that they um, particularly challenge. So these epistemological approaches are interesting, they're important, there's a whole lot more that I could say about that. But I wanted to use the tools of social philosophy. And so I thought, well, there's, there's something else going along here. I was concerned about the epistemological approaches too because they often are modeled on a particular understanding of solidarity where it's solidarity of the privileged with the oppressed. And, um, and a lot of times when people talk about solidarity, that's all they mean. They just mean when the privileged join in solidarity with the oppressed. I, I, I hear this a lot when, actually, when students come back from break trips and they're, they're talking about their experience and, and being in solidarity with the poor. What about the opposite? What about when the, when the poor are in solidarity with each other or, um, or with uh, the privileged? What uh, can we say there? The epistemological approaches tend to focus on the um, actions or inactions or omissions of the privilege. And I wanted to see if there was a way we could understand this um, perniciousness of solidarity, the dangers of solidarity, not by focusing on the group that's privileged. So I turned to social philosophy and I turned to Rousseau. And, uh, and of course, in, in turning to Rousseau, one can see that the motive for uh, the social contract is in part self-preservation. It's to protect us from vulnerability. It's to protect us from the dependency that we get when we are vulnerable to others in the social order, when there are others who are dominant. And so, um, so Rousseau actually talks about two different kinds of, uh, uh, of um, what I call pernicious solidarities, or two different kinds of dangerous groupings that uh, in some sense compromise justice and, um, and prey upon the vulnerability of uh, certain people in the social order. The first one I call the, the cabal. And, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, but we philosophers, we read uh, when we present usually, so I'm not, not used to presenting. So now I'm going to default to my comfort zone and I'm going to read to you just, uh, just briefly. Rousseau offers us a glimpse into two dramatically different social arrangements. The society formed by the end of the second discourse is a despotism. Efforts are exerted to weaken assembled men, this, that's his term, men, by uh, disuniting them. The masses of prejudices that have arisen are further fomented by everything that can give society an air of apparent concord while sowing seeds of real division. Everything that can inspire mistrust and mutual hatred. That's Rousseau. The chiefs, um, then, uh, are uh, those who have amassed power and made others vulnerable to their capriciousness. 
But of course, Rousseau concludes that all individuals are once again equals in a new state of nature. This one ruled by the strongest until, of course, uh, he, and it's, in Rousseau it's he, he, is deposed through violence. Now, the other society that Rousseau offers us is the idyllic society of the social contract, um, also apparent in his novel La Nouvelle Eloise and elsewhere in his writing. The unity of the people is the primary factor that makes an idyllic community. Importantly for solidarity studies, this, that unity is based on a commonality of virtue rather than physical attributes. To be sure, he does suppose that the people ideally situated to accept legislation in a social contract are already bound together by some union of origin, interest, or convention. But it is their goodness rather than their identity that creates the solidarity of the community. Even this idyllic c community includes the potential for harm for some of its inhabitants or for outsiders, and Rousseau recognized that even the best con constitution was unlikely to last. Now the first of his communities, the cabal, or what I'm calling the cabal, is clearly dangerous. Despotism um, is preceded by what might be called cabals in some contexts and perhaps pernicious solidarities in others. Like the despot, they have as their aim the deprivation of a neighbor's freedom, although their own freedom is also depleted. The second of Rousseau's communities unites peoples of virtue, but Rousseau invokes a legislator in part because he realizes that even his ideal citizens need guidance from outside in order to avoid the hazards their unity might produce. While Rousseau's social theory entails a significant in-group, out-group distinction, he does not sanction the in-group making an explicit commitment to harming some or all of those of the out-group. He merely recognizes that solidarities can be dangerous, even those uniting the best of the peoples uh, uh, for just ends. So that's my question. Uh, and, solid, and, and Rousseau, of course, has already um, provided a foundation for us or a, a framework. So solidarities are, are pernicious in two basic ways, as, as Rousseau has suggested. The first is when the aims or ends of the solidarity are themselves dangerous. These are fully aware appeals to solidarity that delineate clearly articulable borders of group inclusion, uh, often involving identity claims, like Rousseau's cabal of magistrates. Internal to the group, appeals to solidarity are used to maintain or strengthen the group, uh, to shore up commitment among individual members uh, when their loyalty seems to be flagging. And the, the example that I use in the, um, the more extended work is actually two. One is xenophobic nationalism, as an example, um, and another is uh, um, the, the KKK in the, in the South. So. Solidarity, then, is used to demarcate an in-group, uh, usually over and against an out-group. To be clear, every solidarity has an in-group and an out-group. What makes the solidarity dangerous in this way is that the goal, aim, or uniting interest pertains to the discrimination, harm, or even elimination of some other group or, uh, or peoples identified by their divergence from the in-group. And, um, and of course, we can come up with a number of different examples. Now, some, we might be inclined to say, well, well that's not solidarity at all. But the problem is that it really involves a justice claim. And, and what we have to do is a sort of a, a comparative justice to, to determine whether or not the, the group, whether it's in solidarity, is a separate question to uh, uh, whether or not it is pursuing a just end. And so I'm suggesting that the cabal is a, is a group in solidarity, but it's pursuing an unjust end. And, um, and perhaps justice is the best framework then for uh, understanding it and maybe even condemning it, but, um, but nevertheless we should be aware of it as a possibility for all solidarities that they, they entail some possibility of um, the in-group, the solidarity group, actually reifying the out-group in a way that is dangerous to that out-group. Now the other is perhaps more interesting. The other type of pernicious solidarity is perhaps more interesting. It's what I call well-meaning failures. This is when uh, folks who really mean well and have social justice ends fail, or, and they fail in a way not to keep the bonds together, which is a different type of failure of solidarity, but fail in a way that causes harm to the, the cause or the, the people that they're actually trying to help. And the example that I use is um, an example of a, a, a letter writing campaign for a Nigerian woman. And this is a, 
uh, an example in, from transnational feminism. A, a Ni Nigerian woman uh, was accused of adultery and stoned, and a letter writing campaign from the Western world uh, was begun on her behalf, right? And, and so, you know, a lot of well meaning folks from the United States and from Europe sent letters to the Nigerian government. Well, it backfired. It backfired because the Nigerian government uh, um, s saw that, in, that they were being told what to do, essentially. And that rather than saying, oh, you're right, sorry, we, we goofed, they in fact reacted um, opposite. And they uh, intensified their um, efforts against her and, and uh, the sentence against her, and then uh, also uh, in other ways as well against other women. And they, they, their aim was to show, you know, sense their resolve against the international efforts to condemn them. Well, so here's a, a good attempt, right? Letter writing campaigns seem like a, a good way for us to engage in transnational uh, solidarity efforts, but it failed. Now we could appeal to the epistemological approaches again and say it failed because of lack of sufficient knowledge, and that's generally how that case. Uh, that case is analyzed by um, Ali Marie Tripp, uh, a transnational feminist, and she takes that approach. She uses an epistemological approach and says they lack the information, they should have consulted local actors. Right? And I think that's a good way to analyze the case, but I think that there might be some other insights we can draw from the case. And so that's why I turn to social risk. Now we're all vulnerable in society and solidarity actually um, entails some acknowledgement of our vulnerability. Often, political solidarity is organized around responses to vulnerability. I um, suggest, I argue, that solidarity also entails social risk, perhaps in the form of physical risk, but actually um, I, I like this, this term social risk because I think it, that it allows us to talk about uh, more things. And, um, and I think there are, in Rousseau's writings and also in some of the, the cases that uh, we can look at, there are three different ways that we could think about the failure to, or the flaws in the assumption of social risk in solidarity that lead to harmful outcomes or uh, uh, dangerous solidarities. One is this willingness to share social risk uh, is inequitably distributed. The inequitable distribution of the willingness to share social risk indicates that some participants or members are only partially committed to the solidarity. Solidarity in all its forms assumes a willingness to share some social risk, usually understood as uh, social, but physical risk may be implied. And it is expressed by some uh, as mutuality. In other words, I'm, I'm here trying to link some of the positive obligations of solidarity, mutuality, with some of the risks um, of, of a dangerous solidarity. Willingness to share is distinct from actually sharing social risk. Not everyone in solidarity will actually share the same risks. Some participants will be more vulnerable because of their personal needs or their status in the larger society. Others will be more vulnerable because of victimization or oppression. And still others will be vulnerable due to their personal circumstances. These accounts of vulnerability might also um, intersect in a way that compounds the adverse effects in political solidarity. However, each member comes from his particularity and willingly assumes the social risks involved in solidarity. The willingness to share social risk, and uh, yeah, I, I need to just keep going, um, must be equally distributed even if the social risks themselves will not be. If there is unequal distribution uh, of the willingness, then those who are willing will find themselves vulnerable to, or rather subject to, those who are not. This is captured neatly in Rousseau's description of the purpose of the second discourse. And here I quote Rousseau. It is to point out in the progress of things that moment when right taking place of violence, nature became subject to law, to unfold that chain of amazing events in consequence of which the strong submitted to serve the weak and the people to purchase imaginary ease at the expense of real happiness. In contrast, the origin of rights within the social contract is in the freedom of each individual. As Rousseau says, the social pact establishes among the citizens uh, such an equality that uh, all commit themselves under the same conditions and all, uh, sorry, and must all enjoy the same rights. So what goes wrong is that some people are unwilling to assume all the social risks and so in, in being unwilling actually hold back their own rights to dominate, 
to dominate others. Now that's not to say that it necessarily unfolds as domination, but in a, a solidarity, it, I, I think that it can unfold as um, harm emerging from the solidarity. The second is that, that um, there are unjustifiable limits to the willingness to engage in social risk. Willingness to engage in social risk may uh, also be limited, causing a solidarity to become dangerous because the risks pertinent to the nature or function of the group itself are not willingly engaged. Within the social contract for Rousseau, the, contr uh, the contribution is nearly limitless. As he says, as an individual, every one of us contributes his goods, his person, his life to the common stock under the supreme direction of the general will, while as a body we receive each member as an indivisible part of the whole. Now I've been in conversation with some um, uh, other philosophers about the Occupy movement and this particular notion of uh, social risk unjustifiably limited. And if you think about the, uh, the strengths and weaknesses of the Occupy movement, one way to think about how the Occupy movement um, arguably is no longer as active or effective is that many of those involved um, limited their particular participation. So in particular, you, you might think of many of the um, well-off academics who joined the Occupy for limited periods of time, right? Now that, uh, that limiting allows for um, certain things, a misframing, a misframing of, of issues and a misidentification of, of who is part of the solidarity and, and what issues need to be addressed. Now that's a much longer conversation but, but hopefully I've given you enough um, to hint that, uh, that this social risk could be at least something to think about, could be potentially even troubling. And then the last is the willingness to share so social risk is strategically withdrawn. When I first started thinking about pernicious solidarities, it was right around the time of the European crisis. And of course, solidarity was the, the term. Now that's a, a different form of solidarity, it's civic, uh, civil solidarity. But nevertheless, um, one of the things that, that arguably could uh, be said about that was that uh, folks withdrew their willingness to uh, 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 contribute those, all of the social risk. The ability to withdraw one's willingness to share social risk indicates power or lack of vulnerability, at least with respect to some social risk as well as disregard for the sharing aspect or mutuality. Strategically withdrawing willingness to share social risk is comparable to never actually being willing in the first place. Solidarities fail when the willingness to share a social risk is absence in a large portion of the relevant participants of the population. To paraphrase Rousseau, we each give ourselves to the whole community and, we, um, and the entire community acts on our behalf in response. These relations of trust and vulnerability mean that at various times other people will be in a position of dominance or power over us and may take advantage of us. The transient relations of power or dominance and vulnerability ought not to become so pervasive as to keep an individual from acting freely or so unpredictable as to expose some members to undue risk and, and of course repeatedly undue risk. The interdependent organization of peoples and societies means that individuals, groups, and nation states are reliant on others in some way. Mutua mutuality of associative ties make rights meaningful in various social contexts. As Rousseau argues, Finally, each by giving himself to all gives himself to no one, and since there is no associate over whom one does not acquire the same right as one grants him over oneself, one gains the equivalent of all one loses, and more force to preserve what one has. In other words, we're stronger in solidarity. Although Rousseau was speaking of a single society, the mutual interdependence of the heart of, at the heart of his social contract uh, serves as a fitting foundation for all forms of solidarity. Now, so what's, what's the point of all this? Well, in a way, it's just following up on a curiosity, of course, right? But on the other hand, it, it, it does invite a, a rethinking of, of certain aspects of political philosophy, and then also, um, I think it has some important implications for contemporary political philosophical discussions about transnational solidarity networks. And, and that's, that's where I'm headed, that's where I'm going. One of the things that I see is that um, it shifts, instead of uh, society being understood as a voluntary organization, it shifts our uh, analysis in, in an important way. And by asking how solidarities cause harm, I think we're um, 
uh, turning our attention uh, away from the good that solidarities do, and, and that's, you know, it, it's important to acknowledge the good that solidarities do, but also turning our attention to see how um, in our, our, the formations of our groups, we uh, actually um, cause uh, various sorts of harm. So I think uh, there's just an awful lot to do the, with transnational, I've been working with transnational feminist solidarities uh, and, um, and the, the emphasis in the literature is all on uh, uh, how do we build the bonds? How do we make the connections across borders, especially given linguistic, um, ideological, and, uh, and even some feminist barriers and, and arrogant barriers? How do we make those bonds? What if instead we turned and said, now wait a minute, let's, let's presume the bond and figure out what's harmful and, and started to look at it from a different angle and see where that gets us. Might not get us anywhere different, but I think it's worth looking at. So um, uh, I think that's the time that I'm supposed to speak, right? So, um, so thank you very much for coming. Um, I, I, I hope you have some ideas that I can steal from you and incorporate into my research. No, I'm just was that recorded? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, no, but, uh, but thank you again, and, and I uh, would welcome any thoughts and ideas and questions that you have.